Hey folks, um, well, good afternoon. Um, hope everyone can hear me okay. For those who don't know me, um, my name is Erica Albrecht here with HDR in our Louisville office. Um, I'm here to kind of introduce our speaker. Um, wanted to say thanks to everyone for, for joining um, these sessions. Also want to kind of couple housekeeping things. If you have any questions um, as they get into it, feel free to chat those to send those through the chat function. It'll be easier for, for them to see as they go. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Taylor Perkins. He's with Stantec and he's gonna give us a presentation today on the US 60 over the Cumberland River Bridge um, seismic design. Um, and Taylor, we appreciate you taking the time to put this together. I know there's a lot of folks interested in hearing about it. So I'll turn it over to Taylor. All right, thanks Erica. Um, and Thank you everybody for joining our uh, presentation today uh, on the geotechnical and seismic concerns of the Smithland Bridge Project. Uh, I am joined with uh, two of my geotechnical colleagues here at Stantec, Will Modrel and Enrique Farfan. Uh, I would like to give a nod to uh, Kurt Schaefer who spearheaded our geotechnical efforts on this project. Um, fortunately, Kurt couldn't be with us here today, but uh, he did want everybody to know that any comments, questions, critiques, or concerns can be uh, sent directly to him. Uh, I am seeing in the chat that uh, maybe uh, can't see the presentation, or uh, we we do have our webcams off, so you won't. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you won't you won't be able to see us personally. Uh, so without, without further ado, we'll uh, go on through the agenda. I'm going to start out with a uh, just a brief discussion of the project background, and then I'll hand it off to Will to, to talk about our field exploration efforts and some of the geotechnical lab testing and analyses that we performed. And then Enrique is going to uh, talk us through some of the unique liquefaction considerations for this, uh, this project. And then I'm going to close out with some uh, discussion on the structural and seismic design uh, portions of the of the bridge. So project background, the, uh, the project is in Smithland, Kentucky, uh, in the western part of our state. Uh, here in the map, you can see it's about 20 to 30 minutes outside of Paducah up US 60. It's kind of in that area of uh, land between the Tennessee and Cumberland River. And it's actually right at the confluence of Cumberland uh, River and the Ohio River, uh, maybe just a quarter mile from that from that confluence. Uh, one of the one of the real drivers of our work on this project and, and this presentation is the proximity to to the New Madrid seismic zone uh, and the high seismicity in the area. I think we were talking a little before the presentation, and uh, this this local, this site is really just 77 miles from uh, the New Madrid fault itself. So. So definitely a major driver and a major concern uh, for our work on this project. So why are we why are we doing this project? Why do we need a new bridge? Well, uh, I think in the time that I've been working on the project since about 2015, this bridge has undergone two or three emergency repairs and has seen a uh, significant reduction in load carrying capacity uh, that has kind of spurred those repairs. Uh, so that's certainly one important reason. Another is uh, looking at this picture, you can see that uh, that the bridge really is is functionally obsolete. Um, very very narrow lanes. This is a high uh, agricultural region, so there's a lot of wide farm equipment that traverses this bridge, and and when they have to go from one side to the other, it basically closes the entire thing down. So. So this this project is very uh, important and is a critical need for the for the folks in this region. So stepping through just uh, a very brief overview of the of kind of our project schedule to date, uh, there's a couple really <laughs> interesting things to, to note on here. We we started back in June of 2015 with notice to proceed. Uh, Stantec was the prime consultant. We had um, a couple sub consultants working on do it under us. AEI did roadway design for us, and uh, BFW did surveying and uh, utility work. And we really hit the gates running. We did a, a geotechnical overview in September, and within six months we hit uh, PLNG uh, stage. 
And you'll notice from December 2015 to around September of 2019, not, not a lot happened. And unfortunately, we kind of fell into that right away and environmental purgatory that, that projects can kind of we kind of sometimes fall into. I'll talk a little bit more about that lately. But um, but working through all that over that you know, four year period, we finally were able to begin our geotechnical field investigation in uh, late kind of mid to late 2019. Well, the problem there is that we were scheduled for a um, uh, March letting for the project, which means that from September 2019 to around uh, early, late January, we had to complete all the geotechnical field investigation, lab work, analyses, and final design of this uh, major river crossing. Very, very daunting task <laughs> in that um, in that time. And really, most of our design was done concurrent with our geotechnical field work and investigation. And uh, and really, I think I think the fact that we were able to to hit our targets and and make this project a success, <clears throat> excuse me, is is really a function of the cooperation, communication, and uh, and willingness of all parties from the from Stantec on the geotech and structure side and the cabinet and uh, there in the geotech and structures um, uh, practices in the district. To work together to try to try to get this thing where it needs to be, and finally in uh, in April of 2020, the uh, the letting happened, and and a few months later, the project was awarded to to Jim Smith Construction. So just a little little background on the uh, right of way and archaeological issues that that we discussed uh, here on on the north side of the river, you'll see. Um, there in that floodplain is a big uh, agricultural uh, farm, uh, and the landowner there really had had very little interest of working in the state with the state on um, on right away acquisition. So ultimately, uh, the the state did have to go to condemnation on that, and and we eventually got you know the clearance we need to to get in there and do the work. From an archaeological perspective, uh, we did find um, artifacts while while digging up in this area and eventually had to progress to phase three archeology span to kind of clear uh, this area where we were trying to build our bridge. So that again was another hurdle. And I think that you're gonna hear Will talk a little bit more about that kind of stuff in detail. Uh, so now, but before I do turn it over, I do want to give just a very uh, quick overview of, of the bridge itself. Uh, there's three main units. There's a South Approach unit uh, navigation span over the river, and then the north approach. Uh, the south approach starts up on a bluff in Smithland, and uh, you'll see rock line uh, drops dramatically down to the river. This is a three-span PPC I-beam bridge uh, supported by hammerhead piers, uh, spread footings at the semi-integral end bent and at Pier 1, and uh, H-piles at Pier 2. Navigation span consists of a single-span truss, uh, supported on uh, large piers. The foundations consist of eight uh, eight foot diameter drilled shafts. And then the north approach span is longer. Um, it's a six span PPCI beam structure with a uh, pretty deep, pretty deep extent to rock. Uh, foundations are supported by 30 inch diameter steel pipe piles. So now I'm going to turn it over to Will to talk a little bit more about uh, our field exploration. Thank you, Taylor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will Modrell. I was the geotechnical project engineer um, overseeing the field exploration and the majority of the analyses on this project. As Taylor mentioned, uh, the bridge was broken up into three portions. Um, the first being the south bank, um, which included abutment one, at station 114.91.83. It also included, included piers one and two, and then uh, the main pier, pier three, uh, which would begin to support that navigational span. Between uh, abutment one and pier one, uh, there's a, approximately a 60 foot drop, and that is a, a almost near vertical slope. 
which made access to those borings difficult. And also as you approach from Pier 2 to Pier 3 uh, towards the river, uh, you again have encounter some steep slopes and some very dense tree growth, uh, which made uh, getting our drill rigs in there to access those borings quite challenging. The North Bank also had dense tree growth from approximately Pier 4 to Pier 7. And as Taylor mentioned, we did have the archaeological area, uh, which uh, interrupted the project corridor from approximately Pier uh, 6 to Pier 8, directly affecting Pier 7 and 8. We had to ultimately offset those borings um, to accommodate uh, the field exploration and also maintain that archaeological area. As Taylor mentioned, this project is near the confluence of two major rivers. And so there's approximately a one half acre um, designated archeological area there right on the main uh, project center line. As you can see here, it directly overlaps uh, piers seven and pier eight. And we were able to work with the KYTC uh, to develop a offset plan for those borings so that we could continue with the geotechnical exploration while preserving that archeological area. Uh, not only did we have a challenge with the archaeological area, uh, we also had uh, challenges with weather. Um, here you can see the, the uh, tailwater map of Smithland Dam, uh, which is right up, just right upstream on the Ohio River. Um, there was a significant period of elevated water from January of 2019 through April um, of that year, and specifically from March to April, uh, borings based on top of boring elevation from Pier 2 to Pier 7 uh, would have been underwater. So during that time, we couldn't uh, effectively mobilize. And there were also high water events in May and July of that year, uh, which inundated uh, the boring locations at Pier 4. Uh, so the, the river and its flooding really delayed our mobilization um, into the later part of the summer. We ultimately mobilized on July 29th. Uh, the field exploration took approximately three months and lasted through October 22nd of 2019. Uh, we ult ultimately utilized two crews uh, with a CME 55 track mount drill rig and a CME 45 truck mount drill rig. Uh, the truck mount drill rig tackled the borings on the south uh, side of the river and the CME track rig uh, tackled the borings on the north uh, side of the river there. We also ultimately had to mobilize a bulldozer uh, to cut, cut access roads to the borings on the steep and sandy banks. Uh, just sort of a, a generalization of our drilling program, the main piers, which would be Pier 3 and Pier 4, those received five borings each. Uh, some of those borings were sample borings of the overburden, some were just true soundings, but all of those borings at the main piers uh, included rock core, and we also included a CPT probe at each of the main piers. Uh, sort of the, the main inland piers uh, just received two borings, uh, one sounding and one sample boring, both with rock core and again, a CPT probe. So here's some additional photos of our geotechnical exploration. You can see uh, we're in very close proximity to the existing bridge, um, but we're also hemmed in uh, by the right of way access that Taylor had mentioned. So some of the results of our exploration, in total, we completed 23 structure borings and 10 CPT probes. That's over 2,000 linear feet of augering. We collected 150 split spoon uh, samples, over 100 Shelby tubes, and over 670 linear feet of NQ diameter rock core. Uh, there's quite a big difference between the north and south banks. The south bank is pictured here above. Uh, and is shale bedrock, and the north bank pictured below here is uh, sandstone, a very hard sandstone. One of the benefits uh, that we tried to schedule into this exploration was simultaneous CPT in traditional exploration. Uh, so Stantex geotech crews and, and drill rigs were out on the site uh, while we had our CPT subcontractor in the field with us. That meant that our field geologist 
was able to give uh, give his draft field logs over to the CPT crew so they could sort of get an idea of, of what exact material they were going to be pushing in and, and sort of where to expect refusal. Uh, so you can see this is a really good example. This is peer, uh, Boring 106 at Pier 3. Uh, so you've got a really good correlation here between what our field geologist logged and then uh, the output of the CPT telling us exactly um, what materials they encountered. And the benefit of the CPT is that it truly is continuous. Our field borings uh, sampled on five foot centers, uh, whether that be split spoon or Shelby tube. Uh, so there is sort of some data lost in between those two samples, uh, but that CPT is able to pick up uh, continuous information for us. With the results of the exploration in and general site conditions, uh, as Taylor mentioned, abutment one is, is up on top of that bluff and it's very shallow to bedrock, uh, which is sandstone over shale. At the base of that 60 foot drop uh, is pier one, uh, we encountered talus boulders uh, that had, had fallen down the slope. Those were the uh, sandstone. Uh, and true bedrock there was at about 12 feet. Uh, moving from Pier 1 to Piers 2 and 3, which is the remaining piers on the south bank there, uh, is generally less than 50 feet to top of rock. It's an alluvium material, uh, pretty consistently one stratum, uh, but it is uh, an alluvium with a higher clay content. And as I mentioned previously, it's over uh, shale bedrock there. The north bank um, is a little bit more challenging. It's generally greater than 100 feet to rock. Um, and the alluvium there alternates between layers of granular and cohesive materials. And also uh, that is the sandstone bedrock there. With all of the drilling and sampling that we had in the field, we had quite an extensive lab testing program. We made sure that our crews uh, in the field there drilling the bridge were operating on five day shifts. So what that meant is that samples and boring logs from each shift were brought back every Friday afternoon uh, to our in-house laboratory here in Lexington. Uh, I reviewed the samples that afternoon or Monday morning and generated a test request. Uh, this was really a, a place where we had a key partnership with Darren Beckett of the KYTC. Um, I would generate the sample test request and scan him in our boring logs and we would have a teleconference reviewing the boring logs and the, the draft of field classifications. And we were able to get testing assigned while our drilling uh, was still going on in the field. It was really critical for that schedule uh, that we had a drilling and testing occurring congruently. And we were also to sort of uh, able to sort of have a targeted drilling program so that we were able to drill at the main piers and the indents first to obtain that critical data uh, to allow us to sort of begin design uh, even though the drilling program was still ongoing. In all, we completed 114 classifications, 40 wash gradations, 100 plus state log of the Shelby tubes, over 100 unconfined compressive strength tests on soil, three triaxial uh, tests, and six one-dimensional consolidation tests. With the completion of all of our lab testing, we were able to really begin our analyses. Um, and we began by characterizing the site based on cl our classification tests. Um, it was a little surprising that the majority of our classification tests returned as plastic. Uh, we really were expecting a much more granular uh, or non-cohesive uh, alluvium material there, but really there was quite a bit of uh, fines and clay content in the majority of the samples that were returned. Uh, and the majority of our wash gradations actually contained a percentage of fines too high to conclusively classify. Uh, so we ended up with the majority of those being split classifications such as an SCSM. As I mentioned, we uh, developed generalized soil profiles for each peer location, uh, giving strength data, uh, whether it's cohesion or fee angle, the cohesion there would have been based off of an unconfined uh, test on a Shelby tube uh, sample, or the fee angle would have been derived from uh, blow counts on that SPT test, the in count there. We also included unit weights 
and uh, LPile inputs uh, the moduli there that you need to input for your LPile analyses. We also included rock data, including unit weight, compressive strength, and for the shale, uh, which would have been on the south bank, we included the slake and durability data. And here uh, to the right, you can see just a sample of our uh, generalized soil profile there at Pier 4. As I mentioned, there were extensive differences between the north and south bank. Uh, the south bank was generally uh, one stratum. It was sort of a clay sand with gravel. Uh, whereas the north bank uh, tended to be more alternating in layers between a cohesive and a granular layer. And again, here you can see our top of rock line, top of bedrock on the south bank. This is specifically Pier 1 was at 12 feet, Pier 5 over on the north bank, well over 100 feet, 113 feet to top of rock there. With these generalized soil profiles at each uh, structure location, we could really truly begin our analyses. Uh, so we started with our foundation analyses and man, we had it all. We had spread footings on bedrock at abutment one and pier one. Those were shallow enough to, to reach and, and be economical for that type of foundation. At pier two, which is on the south bank and abutment two, which is on the far north bank, uh, we utilized end bearing H piles of 14 by 89. Piers five through nine, that's again all on the north bank there, it utilized end bearing 30 inch diameter pipe piles. And the main piers, which would support that navigation span, pier three and pier four, utilized 90 inch diameter drilled shafts socketed into bedrock. For our spread footings on rock at abutment one and pier one, we recommended presumptive bearing capacities based on the strength limit states. And for our driven piles, uh, we calculated resistances using the LPile software and drivability analyses were completed using the GRL WEEP software. Our drilled shafts were designed to the Ashto LRFD 8th edition standard. And we developed our material parameters using the two thirds average of our unconfined compressive strengths on all of our rock cores. You can see the huge difference in strength here between the the shale at pier three uh, with an average compressive strength of 68 tsf uh, however the sandstone at pier four had an average compressive strength of over 1200 tsf and it's important to note that um, on the north bank in that sandstone it was so strong we actually had to use uh, the concrete as the limiting factor there when we were calculating our side resistance the compressive strength of the concrete in these shafts is 4,000 PSI. We also uh, analyzed slope stability. We evaluated both, both riverbanks, north and south riverbank at center line. And we ran spill through stability and side slope stability at station 134 for abutment two. Uh, and all of those locations were evaluated for both static and seismic conditions using the slope W software. And you can see here this table uh, are some of our output analyses for the uh, abutment two there at, at station 134. And we had satisfactory factors of safety all meeting or exceeding the KYTC targets. As Taylor mentioned, this bridge has had to have several emergency repairs over the years, uh, including one on the south bank. Uh, the existing river bank there is very steep. It's approximately a one to one slope. And we knew that there was existing stability issues there uh, due to the sheet piling <coughs> installed around the existing main pier. So stability on this sl uh, slope was going to be a challenge. Uh, ideally, we would have flattened it uh, back to maybe a three to one. Uh, however, with the pier three pile cap here that you can see, and it needing a minimum amount of, of cover to prevent any scour, we were uh, restricted there to a, flattening it to a two to one slope. And that was able, uh, we were able to make that work for stability purposes. So we took a one to one and flattened it to a two to one uh, to achieve stability out there on the south bank. We also completed stability analyses at station 134. 
uh, are boring at the toe of the slope. Again, this would be on the west end um, of that embankment at station 134. Encountered potentially liquefiable soils. You can see here in our stability model uh, that that's shown within the in the red layer there. The new embankment for this bridge was going to be bound to the east uh, by the existing embankment of the bridge. So therefore, we were not as concerned about potential liquefaction under the existing um, embankment. However, I mentioned we were drilling this uh, and analyzing this project in stages. So when we knew that we had potential liquefaction issues uh, at this embankment, we didn't know exactly the extent of that potentially liquefiable layer. And so we began to develop a contingency plan of ground improvements. If, uh, if that potentially liquefiable layer had been encountered underneath the main embankment itself at the end bent uh, or uh, out further towards Pier 9, uh, we would have had to do something to prevent uh, a, a, a significant slope failure, which may have, uh, during an earthquake event, impacted Pier 9 and deformed that structure. We would ideally have liked to flatten the slope. Um, you know, that embankment's built on a three to one and flattening it to a four to one or five to one really would have helped our stability analyses there. Uh, however, we could not do that as Taylor mentioned due to right of way restrictions. So I mentioned that we had developed that uh, contingency plan for ground improvements, uh, which would have been rammed aggregate piers uh, thankfully, further borings and CPT analyses in the area indicated that that really was sort of an isolated pocket there uh, on the side slope um, of that abutment too, and so that it was not going to be a major impact for our stability analyses. We did also encounter additional potentially liquefiable soils uh, at Pier 4. This would be the main pier on the north and uh, uh, North Bank. The CPT was uh, really critical in, in picking up this layer, and that's really where we got the majority of our data um, for this. And, and again, it was encountered in our boring uh, 1013, but not 1017. So we didn't have data from it from two borings, but rather one and the CPT uh, boring. Again, that, that potentially liquefiable layer there is shown in red. And now Enrique will give you some more data on the liquefaction considerations on that Pier 4. Thank you, Will. Uh, my name is Enrique Farfan, and I work in, in specific the seismic hazards for, for this uh, bridge. So I want to start. Um, sorry. Okay. I want to start uh, um, reviewing some of the concepts for Soil liquefaction, um, I think in our mind, uh, when we think uh, most of the times that soil liquefaction is that the soil, the pore pressure develops so much in the soils that become this heavy fluid. And uh, of course that occur when you have uh, saturated soil uh, involves the transfer of overburning stress to the skeleton, to the pore pressure. Um, and of course there is a reduction in the, in the effective stress. Uh, but th th there is something important to keep in mind here is that uh, we, when we say low soil liquefaction, also we need to cover the strength reductions of these fine soils that due to the cycle uh, sharing uh, reduce significantly their the capacity to resist the, the, the any shear. Um, with these uh, figures, I want to illustrate a little bit uh, what is going on uh, during these two uh, modes for soil liquefaction for granular soils and, and for fine soils. Uh, as you can see, they, you have the critical uh, lines there, and, uh, and we can see how from one state we can identify if the behavior of the soil will be contractive and, you know, or dilated. So this is important because um, uh, identify uh, if the soil will be changing in volume, uh, in, uh, increasing in volume uh, for a contractive, uh, uh, um, contractive behavior, or will be um, changing in volume for a dilative uh, behavior will uh, give you a picture how this soil can uh, lose the strength. Uh, in this case, if you see to the 
left of the, the, the figure, uh, you can see uh, the cycle softening and the cycle mobility illustrate there uh, how this uh, fine soil can shift in the effective, or, uh, effective stress without changing the void ratio and uh, void ratio and uh, and show a decrease in in the capacity to to uh, resist any shear. Uh, in the in the right side, you can see the, the classic flow liquefaction that we understand for a contractive uh, soils. Um, of course, that um, we imagine here loose soils that uh, they start uh, losing the effective stress due to the increase of pore pressure and moving to the uh, critical uh, state. So that's important to, to understand because when you evaluate uh, the soils, the, the potential liquefaction, so you need to uh, encompass all the granular material and of course the fine soil uh, material. Uh, the consequences of liquefactions are, are many, as uh, so I, I can illustrate in this, these pictures, uh, some boils, uh, flow failures of a slope, lateral spread, ground oscillation, loss of bearing capacity. Um, of course, these are, are extreme events, uh, especially when you have a thick alluvium, alluvium layer on, on site. Um, in, in the picture, uh, sorry, in the, in the picture um, above, uh, we can see uh, one of the Nishihohima uh, Nishiho uh, bridge in 1995 that was hit uh, by the Kobe um, uh, seismic event. And uh, we see some lateral spreading there that affect the, the, the bridge, move the, one of the piers and uh, the collapse of one of the sections. Um, evaluating liquefaction, there is uh, different methodologies uh, out there. I, as you can see here, a, a little list of some of the publications. Um, pretty much the concept is the to identify what is the cycle uh, shear resistance uh, of the of the soil and compare with the cycle shear stress ratio that is happening due to the seismic uh, event um, and. Uh, based on on the experience uh, in the field observations and uh, analysis uh, the, the course has been developed so uh, you can identify these soils based on the cpt or spt or vein shear and uh, determine what is the factor of safety against uh, soil liquefaction uh, i highlighted um, in, in these publications the the reference that we use for for these uh, for the design of this bridge. Um, some of the, the cover of the, the many publications, and of course, um, uh, like any field in, uh, in engineering, uh, you can have contrasting opinions. Nevertheless, uh, the standard of practice is pr pretty much set, uh, but I want to identify here that there is some uh, Overall, there is some uh, contrast and, and information on how you address uh, soil liquefaction uh, analysis. Something important that uh, come out from the use of the CPT is that allow us to identify these soils, um, the behavior. So how it's going to behave like a sound-like or clay-like, and that's what we refer to uh, dilative or contractive uh, behavior. So um, that, that uh, job has been performed by the Robertson and extensively and the use of CPT data to identify those layers of soil. So here's the, the same chart uh, when you can identify uh, the, the soil behavior. As you can see uh, in, the, in the left uh, chart, it's identified different zones here. Uh, uh, where uh, the soil is going to, to behave uh, sunlight, delayed uh, behavior uh, more according to the flow liquefaction that we are familiar with. Uh, I'm sorry, the, in, in the A2 zone, the contractive, where we, we have more the flow liquefaction, uh, delayed of the sunlight, you know, that uh, will have a, a reduction in, uh, in the strength and the clay-like as well with, the, with a, a reduction in, in the strength as well for the 
fine particles, uh, especially silt. So this is an example of our calculations. Uh, we take the CPT data and we run through the procedures stated in the uh, different reference and manuals. Uh, we implemented a heavy um, spreadsheet that they can take our CPT data and uh, all the design parameters, uh, say the, the peak ground acceleration and the magnitude of the earthquake um, that in more detail will be discussed by uh, Taylor uh, in, in the, the sequence of these slides. Um, but it, it allows our spreadsheet and or allow us to identify uh, what is these layers in the capacity of the CPT exploration that the potential uh, could be liquefying. Um, as well, the, um, or, or a spreadsheet allow us to also plot in the Robertson um, figure and uh, identify uh, where these uh, soils will be behaving like a clay-like or sun-like and what is the potential for uh, liquefaction. So you, you can see here an uh, illustration of some of the outputs um, uh, where we can identify uh, in the soil profile based on the CPT data, uh, the different behaviors of the uh, of the soil. Um, so, for example, uh, something important is that uh, um, to identify is that the thickness of the of the layer that could be subject to soil liquefaction, and that is of course based on the number of points that we will have uh, that they are susceptible to liquefiable uh, stresses, and um, and we can identify the layer, the thickness or disregard some uh, layer because uh, there is the presence of these uh, liquefiable sub lenses are, are so small that won't affect the, the behavior of the soil during the seismic event. So some, some of the consequences, uh, of course, of uh, soil liquefaction is the stability of uh, the soil uh, during the uh, the seismic event and uh, and that is traduced in, in grout deformation. Uh, you understand this as a um, the, the the problems that you can have in the stability of the pier of the end bands and uh, of course uh, uh, how this understanding how is going to affect this ground deformation to the structure and you get into the uh, understanding the soil structure interaction. So in this case, I, I try to illustrate um, so that the, the formation of the soils uh, in the, in the in Caltrans figure that is in the lower uh, part of your um, of this slide uh, is showing two mechanics that they are affecting the piers, uh, the lateral spreading, and of course, uh, uh, also the stability of the slope. Um, when you have a free phase nearby the uh, a river or or, or edge the edge of uh, of of the soil uh, and the formation, um, you know these two mechanics uh, can overlap, and uh, and you have a mode that will affect the, any any structure. So I want to illustrate here with a with a video, uh, and this is not related to this project, but. So in in this in this video, um, I want to show the the effect of a seismic event. This is a project that they did in California, uh, but you can see here how the in a exaggerated scale how the the soil at the edge of the embankment near to a river uh, uh, behaved during a, a huge seismic uh, event. And you can see the deformations that is occurring and uh, of course that all these deformations are going to be affecting the behavior and the capacity of the structure to sustain the, the actual loads and lateral loads. And the end of the of the video you can see the, the permanent the deformations that occur after the seismic event.
uh, in this uh, other um, uh, video, I want to illustrate um, the the behavior, for example, of a deep foundation. Uh, the soil has uh, the same uh, soil profile has been turned off, uh, and the seismic event is uh, is the same. And here you can see how the 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 foundation uh, deform and uh, absorb the the stresses imposed to to the uh, seismic the soil deformation due to the seismic load. So this type of um, events, uh, of course, are more uh, uh, usual in uh, in zones that you have a size a high seismicity, uh, thick alluvium deposits that uh, that behave uh, uh, with the seismic. Uh, with the seismic event due to liquefaction deformation and so on and um, there's different ways to to address these um, mechanics to for the, to understand and design um, uh, in the past um, has been using a, a more simple approach which is a pretty much a limit pressure approach that you take all the passive uh, uh, pressures and you pretty much apply that to to the to the structure from the point of uh, the non-liquefiable soil uh, to above the structure to, to the foundation. Uh, and of course, you can go um, to, to a more complex um, uh, analysis where you can use a final element model when you have a continuous model and a 3D uh, analysis. Uh, but um, the, the preferred method is uh, something that is something in between um, and it's an equivalent static analysis that uh, has the constraints, uh, but give you the, the, the possibility to analyze this in more detail and uh, perform the, the analysis of the structure. Um, so th there are different uh, methodologies uh, to, to address that. Um, as you can see that uh, Caltrans uh, has issued a memorandum to designers um, the state of Washington too, uh, um, the Pacific Earth uh, Engineering the Research Center also has been pitched into how to address this uh, uh, this uh, issue. And Pier Four uh, has been subject to to uh, to ground uh, deformation. Uh, you can see here the soil profile and and the location of the liquefiable layer and, a, and the foundation for Pier Four. And here you can have a plan view uh, of, the, of the foundation showing what the geometry looks like. And now it's the, 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 the issue is to solve this and, and uh, characterize what the forces are, will be acting on, on this forma formation, uh, foundation. So, so uh, uh, first we start identifying, you know, uh, how, how much the, uh, the, the factor of safety uh, is suffering here. So we have a factor safety less than one. That means that there will be permanent deformations in this slope, and it will be the soil will be charging over the foundation. So for that, uh, we we need to understand how the foundation will contribute to the stability of the um, of the slope. Um, we do that by running different cases uh, and finding the yield acceleration. Uh, for different pile shear capacities, so we change the the, the, the shear capacity, the forces of the uh, of the uh, piles, and uh, we find what is the yield acceleration, and uh, we translate that to a, a free uh, free field into the the L pile model, so we can change the different free fields, and we will get a different response from the pile, and we have to combine these. Uh, to to get a displacement compatibility so and how you go from the um, from the yield acceleration to displacement uh, you perform a new mark uh, analysis and uh, that will allow you to get uh, from the yield this uh, acceleration and what is the displacement and from there combine that information with the push uh, of the pile where we measure what is the shear developing in the pile and the deformation um, where these curves cross, uh, that is the, the, uh, 
the point where the displacement of the embankment and the pile are compatible, and we recognize that as a point of deformation. Once we identify that uh, in, in, the, in the guidance from Caltrans uh, and, and other guidance, also allows you to determine what is the stiffness of the pile cap on the piles, the, the structure, and develop uh, the curve that relates the force and displacement. Since we know the displacement, uh, we can uh, calculate the force that is acting over this structure due to the ground uh, deformation. And with that, I will pass to Taylor. <clears throat> all right, thank you, Enrique, and thank you to all the structural folks that have stuck around. I promise it's going to get a little more interesting. Um, so, so again, I'm going to run through kind of the seismic design and as it pertains to the structure. And certainly the first part of any seismic design is getting your head wrapped around your, your input motion. Um, so so for, our, for our seismic analysis, we're, we're running a res multimodal response spectrum analysis. So, so that basically means that we need a uh, design response spectrum. Because of some of the concerns that came up during the geotechnical overview um, on, this, on this project and the sloping rock line and the deep uh, depth of overburden, uh, for some portions of the project, we decided to do a site-specific ground response analysis to basically propagate the input seismic motion at the rock level up to the elevation at uh, our, our footings. And to do this, we uh, used a software called Strata and we did a 1D analysis. And we looked at two orthogonal earthquakes uh, at each pier that bared on deep foundations. So that gives us a total of 14 uh, response spectrums that we need to look at um, corresponding with the location of each pier. Now, our input motions uh, came from a really nice report that uh, KTC has performed where they looked at the uh, seismic hazard assessment for the state of Kentucky. And uh, I'm sure many are, are familiar with this document. Uh, what you might not know is that in addition to the to the simplified response spectrum information in the report, there are uh, a whole suite of time histories for every county in the state that can be used for analysis. So that was that was kind of our starting uh, point for our ground response analysis. And once we ran everything through Strata, uh, this is what we get. And of course, this is uh, basically a jumbled mass of data. And the real challenge and one of the interesting parts of this project was trying to figure out how to get from this to a practical design response spectrum, smooth spectrum that we can uh, use for design. So there's a couple different methods uh, to do this. Uh, one of the, uh, well, sorry. So the first step is, is really to filter out some of this data. So we're not looking at all these uh, lines on a page. And one of the things we noticed was there's basically three response spectra that, that bound the, the response of the structure at low, mid, and high periods. So um, you can see those are bolded here on the, uh, on the screen. And we can take out all, all basically the other uh, noise, filter out all the other noise, and kind of just look at developing a smooth spectrum based on these. So the first method we looked at was uh, let's be really conservative and envelope the peaks and come up with this uh, response spectrum that you see here in red. Well, it turns out this is this approach is is way too conservative to us. Uh, we don't want to design um, our structure for these high loads just because um, just because there's a very narrow band of uh, periods that might elicit this response. So a, a much a much uh, a better approach and, and commonly recognized approach is an averaging where uh, you take at each peak, you take the distance between the peak and the valley, and you really average that to get the, the location of your response spectra. So we very quickly threw this through this approach out. The next thing we looked at was doing a code match spectrum where 
the typically the response spectrums that are developed by codes are done in the velocity domain and they have a standardized shape so we can we can we can do some manipulation to our data and come up with this code match spectrum uh, that you see here and the advantage is it's really nice for comparison to to uh, code spectrums because we have what amounts to a PGA and SD1 and SDS, and those values can be directly compared to what is presented in the code and, um, and can be used to generate this response spectrum with very minimal data. Well, the thing we noticed was we're really overestimating the response of the structure in this one and a half to two period range. And it just so happens that that is the range that a lot of the mass of our structure uh, likes to live in. So, so we kind of thought this was a good idea, but decided to sharpen the pencil a little more and do a more custom fitted spectrum. We lose that direct comparison to the, to the, code, to the code type spectrums, but in terms of design, it gave us a much better, uh, a much better uh, design spectrum to use. And if we compare that, to say the ASHTO LRFD spectrum here um, in the orangish color, you can see that um, it, it lower uh, lower periods, the, the ASHTO spectrum is gonna give you a much higher response, but at those longer periods where a lot of our mass is gonna live, our site-specific spectrum uh, is actually gonna give us much higher inertial forces. <clears throat> of course, the code spectrum is based on a uh, thousand year return period, earthquake with a thousand year return period using a prob probabilistic ha hazard assessment. Maybe not exactly an apples to apples comparison since we're using a uh, time history, uh, time history, our input data was based on time history from a uh, deterministic assessment very spe uh, specific to this region. So if you look at the comparison to the KTC spectrum with the site class D, which is where our uh, site would live based on uh, shear velocities, you can see that the site specific spectrum elicits a much greater uh, response in our structure. And I think this is really validation for performing this type of uh, analysis at this, at this location. So now talking a little bit more about our design approach, uh, we, did, we did very closely follow the LRFD specifications, which is a, a force-based design approach where we design our structural capacities based on the forces developed during the earthquake. Uh, this uses a type one global strategy where we keep our superstructure elastic and allow for ductility and plastic hinges develop in our substructure. Uh, here you see an example of <clears throat> the north approach spans where the red dots indicate locations of potential plastic hinges uh, and this is all handled through code specified response modification factors our operational classification here was considered um, essential and uh, that basically uh, indicates that after the earthquake the bridge needs to be open to uh, at least emergency vehicles uh, we did look at we did look at doing seismic isolation. Uh, we did not feel like it would bring the value to this project. Uh, if you look at at least for Pier Three, our performance ratios uh, for the columns, uh, the seismic PR of 9.99 uh, isn't really that much higher than what we were getting at the strength limit state. So we did not feel that uh, that 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 refinement was warranted. And this, this bridge does not have a critical operation classification where it would need to remain elastic at, at very high uh, re return period earthquakes. Our seismic analysis was performed uh, in CSI bridge. Uh, we did do a 3D, uh, 3D model. We used uh, 3D elements for the truss and a spined model for the approaches. Uh, for our foundation stiffnesses, we iterated those uh, using the group software to get a stiffness matrix at the base of each pier. Um, the, the pier stiffnesses were, uh, crack column stiffnesses were determined based on, um, based on moment curvature analyses at each location. We used linear, linear springs for the bearing connections. 
to get our target 90% participation ratio, we did have to include uh, 250 modes, which probably looks like a really high number, and it is uh, a very high number. But this is really a function of the trust modeling. Uh, there's a lot of degrees of freedom in that trust, and each has a very small uh, mass uh, participating with it. So that's what really bumped our modes up for this analysis. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the seismic design features at uh, each of the components. Uh, so looking here at the navigation span, uh, we use disc bearings and we fixed those bearings at Pier 3 and allowed them to uh, expand longitudinally at the Pier 4 location. Um, Pier 3 is a little shorter, so fixing at that location does elicit a little higher force response, but it is a shorter pier and with some of the liquefaction potential that Enrique discussed at Pier 4, we found that this was far and away the uh, best configuration for the uh, expansion fix setup of this span. Uh, the, the force, the liquefaction induced spreading force at that pier was, was nearly 3,500 kips, which is very massive force. But based on guidance from the uh, state of Washington, this, this uh, lateral spreading force isn't combined with a full earthquake force. It's combined with 50% uh, of the inertial loads to account for the fact that the, um, the, the, the lateral spreading isn't gonna occur, is very unlikely to occur during the peak acceleration points of the, the seismic event. So here's the elevation and um, elevation of our, of our main piers. Uh, you can see we consider plastic hinges in the top and bottom of the column. We did look at the potential for hinging at the top of the web wall, but determined that uh, based on, especially at Pier 3, based on the longitudinal response, it was, uh, the hinging was likely to occur at the base of the column. Uh, the, because there's an expansion joint at the approach span, the shear keys, uh, there at the top were designed for 120 percent of the elastic force and we did we did detail this to carry the minimum seat width specified in ash toe uh, and that's why you see a little bit of a bump out there of uh, of the approach uh, bearing pedestal here uh, here the foundations were designed to remain elastic during the earthquake the truss, uh, the seismic event for the truss was a little bit inconsequential. The, the bracing members were governed by seismic, but, uh, but they were designed to remain elastic and they, they all had reasonable sizes. Uh, we did have a traction, we did design a traction frame at the mid span of the truss. And what this does is it transfers inertial forces from the heavy floor system directly to the truss lines uh, without, having to, without having to engage the floor beams in the load path. For the approach spans here, the north approach span was really the problem child for this project. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the pier height varies significantly from one end to the other. And here at pier eight and nine, we are seeing very